Good morning. Can always count on you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. It is good to be together, especially at the beginning of a new week. It's always good to be reminded that we worship and we serve together with a community of other people who are committed to glorifying Jesus Christ and magnifying his gospel in all our life until he returns. And so if you are visiting here with us this morning, we are grateful that you chose to be at First of Anne. And if there is anything that you want to know about the church, our people, who we are, please visit the Connect Center behind us at the Fellowship Hall, or you can find anybody that's wearing a name tag. And for all of us who are here this morning, if there's anything that you need more information about, the Connect Center, both the real life one in person behind us or the Connect Center online, will tell you anything you need to know about what you hear this morning, about what you see in email, or what you hear word of mouth as well. Now, this will probably be, may not be, but might be your last reminder that our congregational meeting is tonight at 6 p.m. During the congregational meeting, we will elect our elders, our deacons, the global missions team members, approve the budget for the next year. So we please, please be here. And um, if you need a little bit of enticement, there is a dessert fellowship at the end of it as well. Men, the fish fry is this Tuesday, and there are still a couple of tables and individual tickets, so please see John Dawson in the fellowship hall or give him a call for that as well. Now, most of us want to know that our children this summer are engaged in biblically sound activities. Summer Safari will be on Mondays and Thursdays, most of June and July. Um, one thing to know about that is that the registration deadline is today. So if you have rising kindergarten or fifth graders, please get them involved and sign them up for that activity this summer. Um, but this morning, I am very excited to introduce Dr. Imad Shahada, the president and founder of Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary. Um, they train um, leaders, Arab-speaking leaders throughout the Middle East and North Africa at, at the seminary through their undergraduate, master's, and doctoral programs. And I was privileged to visit JETS almost 25 years ago, and I can tell you that I was profoundly impacted by the work that I saw there and the people that I met. You can tell it's making me emotional as I speak about it. Um, but we are grateful that you are here. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Braham, Braham um, the Chief Operating Officer of the seminary, for being here today. We are grateful for the time that you took to prepare, but for your presence and to be here and to speak with us this morning. So thank you. Um, now, let's worship together. Psalm 71, 8 says, My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Let's stand together and bring praise to the Lord. Let our 
our grateful hearts now sing. With joy we give this offering. Bring praise. Bring praises. Bring praises forever to the Lord. Bring praises. Bring praises together to Him who is worthy. To Him the endless thanks forever to His name. Praise the Lord. Have your seat just for a moment. Ten days after Christ's ascension, the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Jesus, uh, God had promised for centuries that he would pour out his spirit on his people. And Jesus had promised that he would send his helper. So before ascending to heaven, Jesus told his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so, ten days later, When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. People from every nation were gathered in Jerusalem, and they all heard these people speaking in their own languages. And they were astonished. They were perplexed, and some thought that they were drunk. But Peter said, These people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation came in power that day. 3,000 were saved. The good news began to spread throughout the earth, and the church was born with explosive power. This morning, as we sing together, let's give thanks for the work of the Spirit in our lives. Let's pray that the Lord would continue to work through us in the spread of the gospel, empowering us as his witnesses. Let's stand together and praise God for the work of the Spirit.
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited provoking one another, envying one another. Let your kingdom come 
Please take your seats. Well, let's continue our time in worship as we join together in prayer. We come into your presence, our triune God, knowing there is no God like the three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are in awe that you are eternal and joined in perfect unity. We profess the mystery of this union with our finite minds, but the assurance which comes from your indwelling Holy Spirit. Jesus, we marvel that you said that it was better that you go away so that the Holy Spirit would be sent to indwell everyone who professes you as Lord and Savior. Scripture proclaims that no one can even profess you as Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, you are a comforter, counselor, and power. Holy Spirit, you began the work of proclaiming the gospel to every nation, tongue, and tribe at Pentecost and that enable us to continue that work in the power of the Spirit today. Spirit of God, you were promised as the seal of the Father and Son, guaranteeing an assurance of abundant and eternal life. We bless and praise you for your work in each of us. Lord, as we celebrate this Pentecost Sunday, we also prayerfully lift before you the many celebrations taking place this time of year around school graduations. We recognize that these are seasons of change and opportunity, but also some level of uncertainty. We ask you to provide joy, direction, and encouragement for both parents and students. Father, we also thank you for the chance to celebrate this morning those who have become members of your local church here at First Evan. May they be blessed as part of this fellowship while also being equipped to bless others in your name. Lord, we're also thankful for the chance to recognize your faithful servants on the search committee who prayed, listened, and became one in their recommendation to us of our next, next pastor, Pace McKee. Jesus, we also recognize that many in our church family are going through seasons of loss of loved ones, health issues, and recovery. Specifically, we lift before you Sheila Grosshart, whose sister, Linda Carter, passed away recently, and for Shay Ward, whose sister, Bryden Ward, passed away unexpectedly. We pray your comfort and your peace for both of these families. Father, we also lift Joanne Clark before you, and we're praying for successful surgery this Monday at MD Anderson, that she will be restored to full health. Lord, for our brother Mike Owen, we pray that you would continue to help him to heal and gain strength and mobility. On this Pentecost Sunday, we pray for our global and local ministry partners who are taking the gospel to all people in all places at every opportunity. On this day designated as International Day for the Unreached, we pray knowing that there is still almost a third of the world's population who have yet to hear the good news of the gospel. We praise that the good news of Jesus has been spreading quickly and creatively around the world in the past 50 years, and that people of peace in many areas have welcomed believers into their homes and their families to tell them about Jesus. We pray for God to stir our hearts with love for unreached peoples and for laborers to go into the harvest fields. For our Memphis Ministry Partner of the Week, World Relief, we offer praise for new church partners, housing and employment partners to minister to the needs of those in our community. We also pray that God will continue activating the local church, including First Evan, to lead our community in welcoming newcomers. We also pray for godly wisdom for our lawmakers who enact legislation related to these newcomers. 
May the joy, Lord, of this Pentecost Sunday be evident as we continue our worship this morning, as well as when we go into our homes, workplaces, and activities of this week. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a couple of times of year of the year, we uh, take a moment and um, welcome those who have joined the church since the last time we did it. We do it usually in the spring and once in the fall. And so we want to welcome some folks who are new members here at First of Ann. Uh, membership at First of Ann is certainly not something that's required for your attendance or anything like that, but it does bring certain benefits with it, one of which is having a shepherding elder of someone who you can call on and you can be engaged with uh, at any time that you have that type of a need. But also there's just that side of it of making a commitment, of being someone who says, I'm committed to this local body. I want to be a part of this local body in a formalized way. And so uh, we're so grateful when and honored when folks choose to do that. And we want to acknowledge some folks who have done it. Sometimes people who join the church have been around for a while. Sometimes people who join the church are newcomers to the church. And uh, we welcome them all. So uh, their picture will come up on the screen as uh, I'll read their names we, uh, rather than just having them all come up for the sake of time. But uh, first is William Bateman. And then uh, Nick, yeah, okay, go ahead. Nick and Kendall Blancet. Meg Burgess, who works with our student ministries. Thought that might happen. <laughs> James Fisher. And Justin and Becca Hensley. And Gina Hensley, Benjamin and Esther Kearns, Ethan and Anna Langston, Tori Martin, who serves in our missions office, Patricia Newman, Michael Price. Josh and Jane Raspberry, who recently joined as Family Ministries. And Jeffrey Warburg. So we welcome these folks as formalized members here at First Evangelical Church. Now what we do at this time is we just like to remind ourselves that we do have a membership confession. It's something that the session put together a number of years ago that anyone who joins the church, if you've joined since that time, signs off on this. And uh, what I'd like to ask you to do, if you're a member of First of Ann, to stand. And uh, we would like to recite this membership confession together, which will come up on the screen for you. Having been led by the Spirit of God through the Word of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we do now confess as one body in Christ and as members of First Evangelical Church. We will strive to live as disciples of Jesus in this present age. We will consistently celebrate together through joyful worship. We will generously contribute our time, resources, gifts, and abilities to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly in both word and deed, and we will pursue peace and unity in the church, encouraging and exhorting one another with the truth of God's word to the glory of God and for the edification of his people. Father God, thank you for the body of Christ that you have gathered here at First of Ann. Thank you for these new members. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I want to introduce Preston Klink now, the chairman of our congregation, who's going to come for a presentation. Morning. What an easy job. Pentecost Sunday, new members. We're going to now recognize our pastor search committee. If you're a member of the committee or a member of the committee, please come forward right now. And Robert C. is going to help us. Uh, we're going to acknowledge you and what you've done. Come on down front right over here. I was, I was sitting this morning thinking about these folks. Just all come over one side. It's probably indelicate to use the analogy of oxen. <laughs> but when I think about the incalculable number of hours that these folks have put in, meetings, conversations, prayer, interviews, deliberations, absorbing our questions, or maybe head faking our questions, absorbing our frustration from time to time, we can't thank you enough. And it's an opportunity now for us to do just that. And uh, we're gonna do it this way. Robert C. has some gift cards that we're handing out. And what we want you to do with these is we want you and your spouse to take a weekend off somewhere on us. Do something spectacular. Go to a five-star hotel and then tell us what it's like when you get back. <laughs> Go to a Michelin restaurant, whatever that is. But ex I hope you rec recognize that this is just nothing more than a uh, token, a tangible token of our appreciation for everything that you've done. We wanted to be lavish. We wanted to thank you for everything that the Lord has done through you. That along the way, in all those hours and everything else, it was waiting on him faithfully. And now we see what the Lord has done. And it is good. And we could be more excited and feel the energy. And we want to thank you for your, your part in doing just that. We love every one of you guys, your spouses. Incidentally, we want to acknowledge that it's not just the folks here, but everyone else who has been on this committee the, uh, from the get-go. We're going to provide that for everybody because we want to make sure that everybody gets uh, an acknowledgement of our appreciation and our honor. So let me pray for you right now. Father, we thank you so much for what you have done for this congregation at this time through these servants of yours. Lord, bless them. Keep them. Father, make your, your face shine upon them. Let them, I uh, hope they experience the, uh, the love and the admiration and the appreciation that we want to convey to them, not just now, but in the days ahead. We thank you for bringing pace to us through them. We look forward to what you have in store, Father, that we're going to be part of that. that uh, Father, we're going to be moving out in ministry directions that we can scarce imagine, Father, as a result of this. We thank you ultimately for your work of the Holy Spirit in this place, in our lives, in these events, bringing about that which is good in your sight. And we thank you for all of these things in the matchless name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's great to be here with you again. This is the third time, 2015, 2019, and today. It's an honor that Julia and I can be with you and my assistant, Raham. And we're very glad to, I don't know if you know this, we're very glad to bring you some Jordanian weather here today, this weekend. <laughs> yeah. It's great to be here. I'm just so happy to hear all this 
news about the new members and a search committee. This is, this is a lively, loving church, biblical church, and I, I've known the history of this church for so long. Such an honor to be with you, and thanks for my friend uh, Ron and uh, for him arranging this. And we'll be having him in two weeks in Jordan. This is his tenth time to come teach for us. We're so honored by his ministry and worship. <clears throat> um, bear with me as I translate from Arabic to English in my mind, and then from my English to your English. <laughs> and <laughs> so. Okay, um, <clears throat> before uh, we begin in the sermon, I'd like to read from the text of Colossians 1, 24 to 29. Colossians 1, 24 to 29. I'm reading from the ESV version, as I understand this is the, the version used most in this church. Colossians 1, 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toiled struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This is the word of God. You know, uh, as you well know, the world is in turmoil. Politically, economically, socially, morally. <clears throat> it seems like there's an increasing re re resemblance to the time the times of the tribulation, the unprecedented times still in the future. It seems like it's closer to closer resemblance to that time. It can be discouraging at times. At times it may seem like, where is the Lord? As if he's absent. There's so much trouble. It seems like evil is winning. <clears throat> and it's easy to lose heart. And uh, the question is, what really keeps us going? Persistent, what keeps us going, this kind of persistence that brings result, it pays. What keeps us going? You know, uh, you know this, uh, the book of Colossians was written, the first part of it was, showed the uniqueness of the person of Christ. And that's in the first chapter, just about. And then it could, and moves on to the stability of the body of Christ in the face of so much delusion and uh, incorrect doctrine, and, and that's where we are here today. He begins, Paul begins by thanking God for the Colossians' faith, and he prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will, that they would walk accordingly and be fruitful on the basis of God's action through redemption on the cross. Reminds them that this was done by the unique Christ, who is the image of God, agent, sustainer of creation, head of the church. So he begins with that long prayer typical of Paul. Obviously, Paul is really burdened for the whole world, much like we all are, this church is. He has the whole word, world on his, on his heart. And um, he, he, uh, he, he understands the challenges that they face. And we'll go into that a little bit more. But the, the question again is, what keeps us steadfast? What keeps us persistent? And I think there are some principles here in this passage that hopefully would be helpful to us all. Um, first, we see in this uh, passage that uh, what really keeps us persistent is that we are <clears throat> called to share in his pain the pain of Christ. Notice what it says. 
Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh. I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that, that is the church. He speaks of Christ's afflictions as if, you know, here's, here's a Christ's afflictions, but they're lacking. And he's calling me to fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of course, this word afflictions does not refer to his sufferings on the cross. The sufferings for our atonement. That suffering on the cross was done once and for all. Where what he had done on the cross cleared us from all sin to all who believe in him. That's not what it's worth. That word afflictions used there refers to a, a different kind of suffering. And he spells it out. It's for his body, the church. It's the, for the sake of his body, that is the church. That's what he, so in a sense, Christ is hurting for his church. And that suffering, that hurt for his church is lacking and he's calling on Paul and all of us to join in that, in that lack, to join him in this, in this suffering. Notice that uh, when, uh, <clears throat> when Saul of Tarsus, before he became the apostle, Paul was persecuting believers and the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus and said to him, uh, Saul, Saul, why are you... He didn't say, why are you persecuting the church? He said, why are you persecuting me? So when the church is hurting, it's because he's hurting. Actually, he's hurting before we are hurting. We are to join him in his hurt, in his pain. It's like um, uh, the example of Moses uh, in Hebrews 11. It says, Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Uh, in the spirit, he's led to understand that we, yeah, centuries ahead of the sufferings of Christ in, uh, in that, and we know that all the Old Testament speaks of Christ, points to Christ, and he, he, he considered suffering for Christ, the suffering nature of Christ as a greater, greater honor than all the treasures of Egypt. And again, in Hebrews it says, let us go out uh, to him outside the camp, bearing the reproach, you know. And in, in the Lord's language, he says, uh, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He was joining him in his pain. You know, <clears throat> you know actually, um, uh, there's a, a sense, <clears throat> but it's really sobering when you read some portions of scripture Speaking of this, of Christ's suffering for his church. Uh, one particular passage shines out, and that is in the Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, in the letters of Christ to the churches, the seven churches. And we can assume that these letters to the churches are meant to be describing the church throughout history. Because uh, every letter of the seven letters ends with, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. So what Christ says to the church in Smyrna, the Holy Spirit says to all the churches. And in those letters to the churches, five of the seven he's unhappy with. <laughs> you know, it's either because of lack of love putting knowledge before love, or it's disregard for the truth, so much wrong teaching, allowing that to stay and stay, or it's really ignoring sin, continual sin. That's a third common element in these five churches. And then fourthly, it's the paying more attention to the outward than the inward. And he's unhappy with the churches. <laughs> And um, some churches do well, some do not. Uh, there's a, um, there's, but then Christ is continually seeking after, the, seeking after these churches, like he does with us, individually and corporately, giving second chances, pleading, pursuing. Sometimes he's pictured as outside the church, knocking to come in, asking for permission to come in. 
Sometimes he stays outside. He calls the believers to come out to him in his, in his letters, you know, uh, to have a fresh start. So Christ is really hurting for the church. We can imagine him today. You know, we think of the church worldwide. In Europe, the church is so, so weak, unlike it was before. So much has come into the church today, you know, that is, breaks our hearts. We never imagined some of the things that are happening. Uh, you know, uh, error becomes right and right becomes wrong and so forth. So he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I, I don't know about you, but Paul here is saying that it, what keeps me going is to realize that I'm called to share in his pain. He says, I rejoice. He, he, he draws power from it. You know, what an honor to join him in his pain. You know, it's an encouraging thought in the middle of dark times to think that we're joining him. He understands. He's been there before we have been. He understands our world, understands the situation we're in. <clears throat> so, um, uh, you may ask, well, is it worth it? <laughs> is it worth all this to suffer like that with him? Is it worth it? Of course it is. Not only are we called to, to share in his pain, we're also called to share in his very plan, what he is doing. It's a great plan. And he explains it like this, of which I became a minister according to the steward. Now he says according to, that's a plan. According to the stewardship, he's been given, given uh, a responsibility. It was entrusted to him to carry out a stewardship from God that was given to me for you. It's a transferable thing. It goes from Paul uh, to Epiphras down through generations, down to us. It's a plan of God. He's at work. He's doing something. Okay? And he continues on. Uh, According to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, or literally to fulfill the word of God. So this plan revolved around the very word of God. And he's, he's been given the responsibility to speak scripture. That's our task. Authority of Scripture, the inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of, word of God. It has authority on all matters of life. The Word of God. So here's that plan. It's a stewardship given from God to fulfill the Word of God. And in this, in this very Word of God, there's a mystery. The mystery from which the word, uh, in the original it's mysterion, from which the word mystery came, came. And mystery does not really refer to something that is vague. It's more that something that was not known and now became known. It was not revealed, now it's revealed. What is that mystery? It says, a mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed. Uh, to his saints, not only was it hidden and revealed, God also desired for it to be revealed. He says, uh, to them God chose, it was his desire, chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of this mystery. So there's this, here's a stewardship, a plan, transferable plan, centers around the word of God that contains a mystery, a treasure, okay? Mystery, <clears throat> to make known how great among them the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Now, this, this mystery is engulfed in glory. Uh, how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory. You know, that's typical point. He has these rich words, you know, one after the other. Riches of the glory of this mystery, just engulfed in glory. And when, we, uh, when the scriptures speak of, of glory, 
uh, it's, uh, it has to do with several things. It has to do with ultimate beauty. This mystery is beautiful. It's beauty. Not only that, it's, uh, it's perfection. All the attributes of God come together. It's perfection. It's beauty, perfection, but also speaks of necessity. You know, God is, is a necessary being. He has to be for everything else to be. Everything depends on him. Actually, the word glory in the, in the Old Testament uh, comes f from the word kavod in, in Hebrew, which is the same in Arabic. It, it refers to the liver. You know why liver? Because it's the central part of the body and it's the heaviest. And so when you, when you glorify him, you liver him. <laughs> you make him central. You make him the heaviest in your life, you know. Think, uh, think of a river and a rock in the middle of the river, and, and the water goes around the rock because the rock is heavier. So he's saying this mystery of great beauty, perfection, and speaks of the necessity of the, the one and only true God. That's the, that's the, this, this, this uh, uh, mission I was given is engulfed in this mystery that's engulfed in, in glory, you know. And that's, that's God's plan. <laughs> He's saying, I've been given all this, and I'm transferring that to you. We're called to share in his plan. And, um, and what is, he continues. No, it doesn't stop there. He says, the mystery hidden from ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles the riches of the glory of this, which is, here it is, Christ in you the hope of glory. Wow. That's it. Actually, in a parallel, uh, parallel passage to this, when it speaks of mystery, it, it's in, uh, in Ephesians 3, 6, he says this, this is the mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So all nations are partakers of the promise together. Okay? So he's talking about a a state, a great state for all nations, but here in, uh, in uh, Colossians, it speaks of how this came about. How does this happen that all nations can be united together in this glorious mystery? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, you know, there, um, <clears throat> our problem oftentimes is that we forget. We forget how rich we are. Whom is living within us. And whenever, whenever we sin or fall short, it's because at that moment we forgot who we were. How rich we are. Christ in us. Now there's a lot of theology here, by the way. A lot of theology. You know, it's, um, <clears throat> we've been justified. He's taken our sins away, and he's given us something. He took away our sins, and he gave us his righteousness. What? Made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we may become the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that amazing? That's a judicial act through what Christ did on the cross. But it doesn't come alone. This judicial state we are in comes with regeneration. We've been born again to a new life, a newness of life in his resurrection. We have a new life. We have a new spirit. And his Holy Spirit lives in us. So we've been, there's justification, regeneration, glorification. We are headed for glory when there will be no not only no power of sin, no presence of sin. And there, all nations will be together one day in heaven. And actually, you can put it this way. There's, there's so much theology, special, uh, soteriology, pneumatology, eschatology in this. You know, you can put it this way, that um, Israel is a promise of redeemed peoples 
And uh, the church is the mystery of redeemed people so that it is fulfilled in the heavenly Jerusalem as the climactic gathering of redeemed people. So it goes from Israel, the promise, to the church, the mystery, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the climax, when we're all together in heaven in glory. This is where we're headed. Where does it begin? Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can see the Trinity at work here. That one God, okay? Um, you know, actually, serving Christ is the greatest, greatest profession. We're all called to this. You don't have to be a full-time Christian worker to serve Christ. We're all called to serve him, you know? So what keeps us going? What keeps us going against great odds, against so much discouragement around us every day, is to remember that we're called to share in his pain. But in that process, we're called to share in his plan, his purposes, magnificent. It's way above everything. You know, it's, it's just amazing privilege, you know. You may say at this point, wow, um, this sounds good, but it's just, uh, it's not for me. It's just too difficult, <laughs> too complicated. I'm a simple person. Um, I, I can't do it. It's just too much. Well, you, you can have comfort in that. Not only are you called to share in his plan, but you are called to share in his very power. He's right there to uplift you, to hold you. How do we see this? Now it says here, in um, um, verse 28, now him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, and we may present everyone mature in Christ. Notice that word every. It's literally, it's, we proclaim Warning everyone, teaching everyone with every wisdom that we present every one, every person, every, every, every. That's power. And it says, first of all, we're warning everyone, putting their records straight. Sometimes you need to clean up as you're sharing the gospel from wrong thinking. We, pr we warn or we admonish and then we teach present the truth. And what happens is power in this gospel that we, that we hold, there's so much power in it. They can take any person and every person, if they believe they can take it from, from where they are, no matter what their background is, what their situation is, how difficult that, and take that person to point of perfection. When they meet Christ, they're fully complete in him. That's what he says. For um, we proclaim and warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature, perfect in Christ at his appearing one day. For this, he continues, I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. That's power. Again, the words are, are so rich here. Um, you can put it this way, his, uh, literally, his power inflamed in activity within me. His power is inflamed in activity within me um, with supernatural strength bestowed upon me. You know, so Paul is saying, wow, what keeps me going is not to know that I'm not alone in this. He's right there to give me the power to keep going, just to keep going to keep going. Um, it's, he's not, he does not serve the Lord anxiously. He's not worried. He's trusting God. But he's not passive either. He's active. He's working. He's toiling with everything he's got. Uh, but yet, uh, along with Christ's power working in and through him. You know, it's been... Uh, it's been said that <clears throat> uh, by Hudson Taylor. He said, 
every great work for God is at first impossible. Then it is difficult, but then it is done. So how do we stay persistent? How do we do that? By remembering that we are called to share in his pain. Because we are called to share in his plan. And as we do, we are called to share in his very power. We're not alone. We can do it, no matter how difficult. And we wait for that day when we would meet with him. Maybe close our time in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. I uh, just ask you that we would always be mindful not to forget that when we falter and fall behind and retreat and fall short of your will to be come back quickly because of the great privilege you have called each one of us to persist and given us everything we need to hang in there every day, all the days of our lives until you come. What an honor, what a privilege. So we commit these thoughts to you, asking you for your strength to keep us mindful of your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Shahada, for sharing God's word with us, for encouraging us to, to continue on. What a day of celebration we've had. I mean, some great things to be able to celebrate new folks coming into this local body as, in a formal way as members, to be able to celebrate uh, our search committee and the fine job that they have done, and to be able to celebrate the uh, privilege that we have of sharing in his suffering. And um, let's stand together and let's receive a word of exhortation as we go out today, go out into the world to live life among so many who desperately need to know our Savior. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Amen.